everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Mel, I'm an Uruguayan neuroscientist, but I'm doing a PhD in Germany in systems biomedicine. And on the side, I have this YouTube channel in which I interview scientists all over the world. And today we are talking about behavioral neuroscience. Our guest, Camila, she is from the US, but of Argentinian family. She has studied in the US and she works on these topics, especially development of certain diseases, such as anxiety and the role stress and trauma can play in there. So hi Camila, welcome to the channel. It's a pleasure to have you here. Bienvenida. Hi Mel, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. about your story first. So as you mentioned, my name is Camilla de Maestri, and I'm a third year graduate student at Columbia University. My family is from Argentina and I was born in the United States. When I was 12 years old, we moved to Montevideo, Uruguay, where I started and completed my high school at the Uruguayan American School. In high school is when I became really interested in neuroscience when I was studying for the AP psychology test, which I actually had to take online because it wasn't offered at my school. I then applied to colleges in the United States to continue pursuing this interest, and I ended up at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, where I got my bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in behavior and neuroscience. For my PhD, I joined Dr. Kevin Bath's lab, who was then at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. However, the lab recently moved to Columbia University in New York City, where I'm currently pursuing my PhD in the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior. Oh, you lived in my city! I'm from Montevideo, that's super cool! The other week, I uploaded a video speaking with another person from the US, and he also has some, something to do with Uruguay, and he, he mentions briefly at the end of the video, and for me... So I already talked about this, like for me it's unusual to meet people from other countries and that they say that they lived in my country or they have ancestry from my country, like usually it doesn't happen, it's the other way around, so <laughs> I, I think that's really interesting. And behavioral neuroscience is also fascinating, so can you tell us what do you do exactly? So I would say that there are four key words or phrases that describe my research, and those are development, early life trauma, anxiety, and rodent models. So being a behavioral neuroscientist, I'm interested in studying how both the brain and behavior change across time, specifically during early developmental periods, such as infancy or childhood. In particular, I, I'm interested in studying how early life trauma is capable of changing the trajectory of development of both brain and behavior. An example of trauma that shifts development is growing up in refugee settings with limited access to food or water, or growing up in orphanages with lack of parental care. And we know from studies done in humans that experiencing early life trauma increases the likelihood of individuals developing anxiety disorders, such as generalized anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. And we also know that women are twice as likely of developing these disorders. So a main part of my research focuses on studying changes in the brain that are occurring specifically in females that might be leading to this increased risk. And in order to do this, I use mice so that I can carefully control the environment that they're exposed to in order to measure changes in the brain to help explain or understand changes in behavior. That's really cool and very important research. And can you tell us like some examples of what do you do? So behaviorally, I'm studying a particular behavior that we know is increased in humans with anxiety disorders. And this behavior is called the startle response. To give you an idea of what this behavior is, imagine yourself watching a scary movie and it suddenly gets dark and scary music gets turned on in the background. So you're expecting something bad is going to happen. And suddenly it does. And you jump up from your, from your seat and you almost drop the popcorn that you're eating. This is an example of a startle response. However, individuals with anxiety disorders are constantly feeling that something bad or threatening is going to happen, not just when watching a scary movie. So since this behavior is actually conserved in rodents, I can study the startle response in mice 
when threat is either expected to occur or not expected to occur. And the task that I use to measure this is the fear potentiated startle task. So in the brain, there are two regions that have been identified to be important for threat responding. And that is the central amygdala and the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, or BNST for short. In addition, work has also identified a specific type of neuron that is important for startle response. And these are neurons that are positive for a neuropeptide called corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. So in my work, I'm focusing on studying changes in the activation of CRH neurons within the central amygdala and the BNST of mice who experienced early life trauma. To do this, I'm currently working on using a technique called fiber photometry. What this technique allows me to do is record from a population of neurons within a specific brain region. The way this works is I inject a virus into the brain that is a sensor for calcium. So when a neuron turns on or is activated, what happens is calcium now enters the cell and I can visualize or detect the calcium using the sensor because the neuron turns bright green. Now I can measure many neurons at the same time in a mouse that is actively experiencing the fear potentiated startle task. And I can test for changes in brain activation when the mouse is expecting a threat to occur or not expecting a threat to occur. That's really cool. And is there any result or cool thing that you would like to share with us today about your research or something that you have found? So a really cool result that I found so far has been using this fear potentiated startle task. So the first thing I found is that as expected, mice who were taught that a shock will occur after a tone will show a startle response to that tone when it is presented. So in other words, when the mouse expects something threatening to occur, such as a shock, they will show a startle response. However, mice who experience early life trauma are showing this startle response in situations when the threatening tone is present and when the threatening tone is not present. What this means is that they are expecting threat to occur both when real threat is present, but also when real threat is absent. Importantly, this effect has only been seen in my female mice. So my current work is focusing on understanding why and how this effect is occurring. Wow, yes, and how important it is, right, to nowadays to study the sex differences in every disease, really. We are seeing a lot of this stuff coming up. And could you give us some words about this? Why is it important, really, to, to separate this? So as a whole, this work is really valuable to help us develop treatments that are effective in individuals with anxiety disorders. Work focusing on sex differences is especially important because most of the work that has been done so far to develop treatments has been based on work done only in males. And females actually show poorer response to treatments compared to males. So there is an important and current need to develop treatments that are effective not only for the specific symptoms that the individuals are experiencing, but also that are individualized to the sex of that individual. Yes, for sure. And I also want to use this opportunity to ask you if you have any tips or comments for students or young researchers that maybe they are following your steps. I think a tip I would give young students is to find opportunities to work in a lab setting as soon as possible. And this can be done by emailing professors at your university or universities in your area. There are three general reasons why I would give this tip. The first is that you get to experience firsthand what it means to do work in a lab setting and learn about the research process as a whole. The second is you get to meet other trainees at different levels and talk to them about their own experiences, both positive and negative. And finally, and most importantly, is you can begin to learn what type of research and questions that most interests you. In the end, choosing a topic that motivates you will be the most driving force throughout your own career, or at least it is for mine. That's great advice, actually. Thank you very much. And those were all the questions I had for you for today. So thank you so much, Camila, for being here with us. I really appreciate it. And all the best in your next endeavors. Thank you, Mel. This was super fun and it was great meeting you. Thanks for inviting me.
And thank you for your attention. If you like the video, I invite you to subscribe to the channel, to give a thumbs up, to leave a supporting comment. If you want and are able to support financially, I also have a Patreon account. And with these resources, I'm able to work with people in Latin America to create more content, to upload better quality videos, faster, more topics, etc. everything you want. And I invite you to keep checking out the channel. There's some videos that maybe you missed and it's really cool. So see you in the next video. Bye bye.